welcome to the studio. This is fine, Tuesday morning. And Tuesday is an important day because Tuesday, July 21st, if you're watching this on that day, uh, at the end of today, the founding member rate on the new website disappears forever. So you can't get that starting after 11.59 p.m. Eastern time tonight. So tonight, kind of midnight-ish, minus a minute. Uh, tonight, that founding member rate disappears forever. And if you are interested, I would say sign up now or mark it on your calendar to go and investigate more uh, throughout the day, maybe later this afternoon, because it will be gone forever and you will never be able to get, get it on that rate again. And basically what you get is instant access to everything that's already on the website, which is a lot of courses. I'm not sure how many I'm gonna say. I'm gonna say 15 courses, uh, $2,000 plus worth of content. And then today I'm actually gonna be adding my, um, I have my, my notes of things to do today. I'm porting everything from Patreon to the new website because the new website is so much easier to navigate. Uh, I'm going to be putting up a promo video script. So if you're interested in making your own promotional video, this is a really great starting point. Obviously modify it to, to be yourself and your own voice. But I would say if you're watching this video and, and you feel some sort of connection to me that it's going to be, I would say 90% of the way there. Um, because I feel like uh, if you're watching this, you're probably a candid style photographer that maybe is a little bit more on the introverted side and you just want to run a wedding business and, and you want to book as many weddings as possible. So that, that promo script is, is based on that. I'll also be adding a wedding meeting, a first meeting, the audio from that. So a real couple that I'm really interacting with. Uh, so you can hear all the questions and basically everything that happens in one of my personal wedding meetings. Uh, my contract's going up there. It was on Patreon. I forgot to move that over really quickly. So that's, uh, that's going up there and it's a full editable file. Obviously, depending on where you are in the world, have a lawyer look over it. Actually, regardless of where you are in the world, have a lawyer look over the contract to make sure that it is in fact uh, good in, in your place in the world and that, that you're comfortable with it. But it's the contract that I've been using for, uh, at least in pieces, I, I'm going to say I started it about maybe 15 years ago and I've been modifying ever since. So. Um, it's, it's yours, you can edit it, it's, it's, it belongs to you now if you sign up. Uh, as well as all 60 podcasts that were on Patreon, which is kind of what this, this is today. Um, basically, uh, there was a weekly podcast uh, that was just Q&A, Ask Me Anything style, and that went up every single week for only Patreon members, and now that is coming over to the new website, so there's 60 episodes of that, and if you want to get into those, just queue them up and, and, and listen. You can download them now, which is nice. Uh, before, the Patreon player was a little clunky. Now, now I think everything's going to be a lot easier. Let's get into the Q&A. These questions are all from the members only group for the new website uh, over on Facebook. So if, you, if you're a founding member and, you, and you're watching this and you're not a member of the group, hop over there. Basically, to submit a question, you gotta be a member. This is going to be the only public Q&A of this style uh, that I'm taking questions from the group. Otherwise, it's going to all be on the new website. Um, so I have a few questions. The first one I'm going to talk about is one that I answered last night. Um, so Wes asked, uh, outsourcing, editing, any recommendations? Taylor, did you train someone to outsource to a company? So outsourcing is essentially, if you don't want to edit all your images from a wedding day, for instance, if you're interested in shooting a very high volume wedding photography business, if, uh, if next year you want to do 60 weddings, it is quite honestly impossible to keep up with both shooting and editing at that volume. I'm sure you could, but your life quality would be like, an absolute zero. The reason that I got into wedding photography was essentially to unlock as much time freedom as I possibly could. And by outsourcing, it was really, it was baked into kind of the core of what I wanted my business to be. So uh, first, I guess I've gone through all of the different styles of outsourcing, outsourcing, having somebody else edit your images. I began actually training somebody and, and they worked very well for a little, little while of time. I would say if you're training somebody, unless they are a very special individual, there is a very, a hard burnout time and I would say that if I got beyond one single year one season with somebody editing for me that was usually the next year they were like let's let's not do that again that wasn't very much fun for me so it's it's not a heck of a lot of fun to edit someone else's images and to call images uh, but you can train someone and if you're not doing such crazy volume so for instance doing 60 weddings sending all 60 weddings to somebody to edit that's obviously a very overwhelming task that becomes their full-time job. That is their essentially their life over the summer. And it's not a very fun life, I don't think, overall, which is why you might not want to do it yourself. Um, so I would say if you are hiring somebody and you're training them, know that there is kind of a, a little bit of a revolving door of that. And it might be smart if you are doing high volume to potentially train two people to one, to have backup if, if one of them just kind of disappears and is like, no, no more. Um, usually if you're training somebody, you're working close together, they're gonna give you like a, hey, maybe at the end of October, like not, not again next year. But if you have two people, you can kind of offset the workload so you don't 
overload either of them. And for the most part, somebody's probably going to be doing this as a part-time job. So if you're able to give them, if you shoot three weddings in a weekend and you're able to give maybe two of those weddings to one person and one to the other person, and then the next week, if you're shooting another triple, you flip it. Um, I feel like that just, helps helps them out a little bit and, and makes them a little less stressed out. So uh, that's one recommendation I would have if you are training somebody uh, on the video end of things. So that's for photography. On the video end of things, I have somebody that works for me, similar style that I do, I would say over half of my weddings are video based usually, but typically I give all of those weddings to one person. And I feel like that's a, a reasonable workload. And then it's also shooting in a way that's not going to overload and over stress for no reason. So shoot correctly in camera as best you can. Shoot with manual settings so everything's nice and, and, and easy to start with, as well as white balances that you want the final files to be. One, to make it easier on them, and then two, to kind of lead them in the direction of what you want the actual final files to look like. I would say after maybe two or three seasons, you're going to be shooting well enough in camera that what you're shooting on the wedding day is probably 80% of what you're going to deliver that final image as. Or in some cases, for instance, if I'm doing an engagement session out here in the park and I'm in full control of all of my lighting and um, poses and everything, that I will usually just edit from the JPEGs because the, the way the JPEGs come together in pretty much every camera system now is kind of the ideal of what you want to edit to uh, when you're, you're at that RAW file and you load the you see the JPEG preview when you load into Lightroom and you're like, oh cool, that's a great photo. And then the raw file loads in underneath it and desaturates it and changes the image. And you're like, ah, well, I'm just gonna add it back to what the JPEG looked like. You can alleviate that step by just simply editing from the JPEG. Um, all the presets, again, if you're a member, you'll have access to all of them. If you're uh, not a member yet, you can get the free pack that has three of them in it. Uh, the, that video came out two days ago. Uh, if you have access to those, I run those on my JPEGs and I am quite happy with the results. And I would say like, I know, I know it's kind of funny to be like, I shoot JPEG, um, obviously shoot raw as a backup, but if you are shooting the correct JPEG, why not just kind of edit from there? It'll speed your time up. Uh, Lightroom is a bit of a resource hog. And if you're shooting a JPEG, it's so fast to process everything just to drop that preset on it. Maybe bump, exposures here and there. Maybe get a little green tint out of there if you're shooting out in a park. Um, but overall, I would say that that's kind of my strategy. But the question was outsourcing, training a person, good, burnout, going with a company, good, um, cheap usually. So for instance, I use a company that's $199 per month for unlimited editing. So I still have to pay additional if I, if I want them to call the wedding, but it's a yearly contract. You sign up $199 a month and they will edit every single thing that you send to them um, in regards to weddings and engagement shoots, I guess. I usually process my engagement shoots because it really only takes me maybe 10, 15 minutes um, to both call and edit them. For wedding days, it's mostly just the time and mental energy to sit down and to block out time for an amount of time that's unknown. And I feel like that that kind of stresses me out. So that's why I usually don't edit my own weddings. Um, plus, I guess like burnout wise, it's almost better to be sending them out to somebody else with fresh eyes that can actually sit there and, and maybe wasn't there on the day. So they, they can put together a better story in the gallery overall if they are calling for you because you kind of, you were there, you might know too much. Uh, to somebody else to call in to create that gallery, I feel like is there there is benefit to that. Um, with a company like that, you might not always have the same editor. Some companies will give you the same editor. I think uh, Photographers Edit will do that, but they do not have an unlimited program to my knowledge. They might, it might be expensive. Um, I would say there are a number of companies in that $199 kind of price point per month for unlimited editing. Some of them have strange and interesting rules. I was with Shoot.Edit for a very long time. I love the company, I, I love their work, but they had at the time, I'm not sure if this has changed, maybe, maybe look this up if you are a hybrid photo video shooter, but at the time there were very strict rules on what galleries from wedding days actually like would be accepted into their unlimited program. And for me, kind of the deal breaker was that uh, it was a percentage based thing. I forget what the percentage was, but say it was 70% of the images had to come from my camera, 30% from a second photographer, or it might have even been 60, 60, 40. But when I'm shooting hybrid, if I am the kind of the main video shooter of the day, uh, again, in the how to build a highlight film course, I talk a little bit more about this. But basically, if I know I'm with a very strong photographer, I'm going to lean a little bit more into video. If I know I'm with a very strong video creator, I'm going to lean a little bit more into the photography of the day. And that means that we're gonna be a lot more 50-50. And I found with them that because of that rule that I had to upload a bunch of just blank frames that I was not going to use to have them edit to work around and I felt really, it really made me angry. So that's why I left with them. I'm now with a company called Evolve, which is Sal Sincata's company. And so far I'm, I would say, 
85% happy. I still have to do work to the files when they come back. I still have to change some things. And um, every time when things come back, it's it's never like a catastrophe. It's never like, why? What, like, what did you guys do? You missed this entire section. It's always very well done overall, but there's always something that's kind of globally wrong with it. So that means that maybe all the white balances are a little bit too cold or all of the exposures are a little bit too dark. And I can just go in and globally adjust that as well as adding my preset and some tweaks to, to all the images. Uh, so there is kind of some time that goes into that. When you get into a company like Photographer's Edit or Image Salon, which is based in Montreal, Canada, they're both, I would say, probably my two top recommendations if you do have a little bit of a budget for this or if you're shooting 20 to 30 weddings a year and it becomes a lot more manageable that they will edit from your preset and i believe they will both i know photographers edit will give you an assigned editor that's always working with your files and they will really create a gallery that's just 100 percent ready to go as soon as you get it back just upload that to wherever you upload things and and send it out to your clients um i would say that those are kind of the three the three methods of it. One, you're going to see some burnout. You're going to have to manage. You're going to do some turnover. You're going to feel bad if you don't have work for a month. Um, if you're hiring somebody and training them. Number two, if you have significant volume and you don't mind putting in a little bit of the after work. Or number three, if you want somebody to just really knock every single edit completely out of the park, uh, image salon or photographer's edit, I would 100% recommend. Um, so that wasn't even a question on the on the on the thread here. We have 23 questions. The post got three likes, but it got good interaction. Cody, NG, from I believe Markham, Ontario, Canada, which is just north of Toronto, an hour west of me here, and 40 minutes south of Peter McKinnon and Maddie for, for YouTube uh, references. All right, question one. How often do you use a 7200 as a second shooter? Uh, I currently rent a 7200 as a primary, but not sure if it's worth renting one if I'm second shooting. Um, I would say, I guess it depends on your on your lead shooter overall. Um, I would say if you are able to use those images and, and they're cool with you using those images in your portfolio, I would probably continue to rent it or I would potentially be looking to buy, um, I know Vistec will do kind of a rent to own program or finance or whatever it's called, like leasing things. Um, I would either, I guess whatever your dream 7200 is, uh, there's a pretty good chance that the, the Tamron G2 70-200 to 2.8 is going to get pretty close to whatever, whatever that dream piece of gear is and it's gonna be a heck of a lot less money. So I would say go Tamron 70-200. If you have a lot of stuff coming up this year, um, I would say it's probably worth investing in that and you can lease it out or you can finance it out or um, rent it out or whatever it might be um, through Vistec and I feel like they're, they're pretty good with that. I don't know the exact terms and everything, um, but know that if you are leasing a piece of gear like that, or if you are um, like rent to owning it, that you're gonna end up spending a little bit more in order to get it um, for, I guess, less financial impact right now. Um, but you might end up spending an extra two, $300 to buy that lens um, over time. But if it makes it easier now, and also it's all a business write off hopefully. So hopefully as your business scales, that your, your lease um, on that equipment will kind of not really matter too much. Um, but I would say that would be my, my recommendation as a second shooter. Um, I don't know what I use. I usually stay on an 85 regardless. So if, if my, if the, if I'm the, or if, say for instance, I'm shooting with my wife, Lindsay, if Lindsay is on an 85, I'll probably switch to something wider. But if she's on a 50 or she's on a 7200, I'm probably just going to hang out on my 85. I'm comfortable there. I'm, I'm good with that. But if I was in the portfolio building process of things, uh, or for instance, if I know that I'm going into like a crazy, really difficult wedding, I might, uh, maybe ping my lead shooter on that and be like, Hey, do you have anyone that might be able to let me use a 7200 through the wedding day? And maybe they might have some leads or they might have a friend that might be able to let you borrow one um, rather than spending, I think it's like 150 bucks or whatever to rent one. And if you rent one 10 times, you've more than paid for the cost of a Tamron uh, G2 on that. So um, that would be kind of my recommendation right now. Part two or potentially a completely different question. Um, when do you expect to see more wedding inquiries. Um, when do you think that they're gonna start picking up? Throwing a lot of money into ads ever since the restrictions started to ease up, but I haven't had any luck with inquiries. So in, at least I, I can speak to my experience here, and I guess this relates directly to you as well, Cody. Um, in Canada, we are now, as of this point, or as of, I guess, last Friday, allowed to have weddings, outdoor weddings with 100 people or indoor weddings with 50 people. I'm sure there's going to be a lot of really difficult restrictions in place with both of those to, to make sure everything is safe. Um, I know that a lot of my couples, well, they are rolling forward with weddings. I have, I think, three weddings, four weddings now in August. Um, well, people are rolling forward with them. 
I don't think that people are too like just excited to be booking their wedding just yet. My inquiry spiked, I'm gonna say maybe a month ago for about a week when I guess everybody got bored or it was, it was like the week before everybody went to the cottage. Uh, I got hit with a lot of inquiries that week and then it kind of calmed down a little bit overall. I would say that probably September is when it's going to get really kind of crazy serious as far as inquiries go. So I might limit the budget now and, and keep maybe that $10, $12 a day or whatever it might be um, over the month of July and August and then really kind of ramp things up and create some great content that is really helpful for people and when they're clicking on your ad, um, don't just send them directly to your website, set up something that's actually helpful for them, um, a reason for them to click on it, and a reason for them to kind of share that article potentially as well. If you're making good content that's helpful for your local kind of brides in the, in the process of just getting engaged and potentially getting married, um, you are going to see a lot more shares kind of on that content. And then beyond that, just making good stuff is gonna stick around in the internet a lot longer and rank better for SEO uh, overall. But that would kind of be my thing. I feel like September, once everything, everyone comes back from the cottage, it's, it's a very strange year uh, as everyone knows but the it's it's very difficult to kind of figure out the psychology behind everything and I feel like if you're watching this from anywhere else in the world it, everything feels very pocketed right now at least from the reports that I've been getting from other wedding photographers all around the world so um, that would be what I would be doing but also just keeping an eye out that if I see a week that really does kind of spike up um, I would maybe be putting a few more dollars into that and then also just I guess the the psychology of likely people that are booking a wedding now or booking a wedding in September, they're probably getting engaged at some point over the summer. So they really are uh, kind of like full experiencing the weirdest time to plan a wedding. So the more you can lean into that and be a helpful guide, there's a video where I talked about being the guide uh, on YouTube. And I feel like if you can do that, you're going to be finding yourself very, very incredibly busy in 2021. All right, next question, Diane asks, if you could choose your main body, which are you using a D850, 780, or the Z6? Currently debating on the purchase. I currently have a D750. I would say either a D850 or a D780, depending on, I guess, price points of both of those. I would have no problems going with a used Nikon D850. Um, I would say either of those will make a great main camera. If you are leaning more on the video side of things, I would say probably go D780, just because of the advanced video stuff that's in there. Um, or if you don't have any weddings that are happening imminently, to maybe hold off for a little bit because all of the Nikon rumor sites are all about that there's a Nikon Z6S or whatever they're calling it, uh, potentially coming out with two card slots. So I might hang out and wait and see if there's any truth to those rumors. Um, even though I work with Nikon, I have absolutely no visibility on their product at all. So I also don't know, um, but that would probably be my recommendation if you are looking for something like the Z6 and you can wait a couple of months that there might be something out that better fits with two card slots, essentially. It's kind of what I'm trying to say. So Z6 with two card slots would probably be the most ideal Nikon solution to a wedding, as long as you're cool with the EVF. I personally gravitate towards um, an optical viewfinder, so I still like the 780 and the, the 850. And um, I'll, I'm gonna start using my 780 as the main camera this year, and then we'll see where that takes us. But both the 850 and the 780 are both incredible cameras. Next question here, Tom says, uh, I suffer with nerves before family shoots that I do. Any advice or tips on how to deal with this? I would say to collect a bunch of images of the family photos that you want to take on that day. So basically just kind of tailor it to, say for instance, you know it's a group of six people showing up. Um, if you can go through and you can find a Pinterest board with a bunch of photos of six-ish person family setups, I feel like that calmed my nerves quite a lot. I feel like that calmed my nerves a lot for wedding days specifically, that if, if I knew at least a few photos that I could kind of bounce to if I got completely stuck, it helped me have kind of that, a more of a sense of confidence throughout the shoot that really kind of helped me just kind of bridge that section. I feel like I'm, I'm fine and then I feel like a bit weird and then I feel fine again. This is kind of how shoots go for me. Um, and if I have something to help bridge that time that I just, I'm like, I don't know what to do right now. Like I'm, I'm stressing out. Uh, if I have something to look back on and then also to have a visual aid to actually just show to people, I think is, is totally fine. Um, especially for families, if you can just have an image, even if it's something that you didn't take and you can just kind of show them like, hey, this is kind of the setup that I'm looking for. To visually do that, for kids, it's, it makes it a little bit easier, and for adults, it's like, okay, cool, we'll just do that. Um, and that can hopefully help you bridge kind of that, that moment of stress. Um, but yeah, I would say the more you can prepare and the more that you can just kind of know exactly what you wanna be doing, um, the easier it's going to be. And then just doing it over and over and over again, so that's the way that 
I kind of got over wedding. So the, the more I did it, the more I realized that I could just kind of solve most of the problems that I could ever encounter. And uh, that kind of made me, I guess, at least three quarters comfortable going into most situations. Um, Joshua says, I'm looking to take on a hybrid coverage subscription model, similar to how you talked about in the previous post. So what Joshua was talking about is um, essentially, or at least from what I understand here, to do kind of a commercial style thing. I'm actually going to be, so the, the course that's gonna be coming out, I think in September, or potentially August, I might flip them, I'm not sure yet, uh, is going to be a lot more based on this and how to do a hybrid subscription style um, just content creation business for your local area. Uh, basically, everybody now realizes how important it is to have a great presence online and a lot of people have really amped up their online spends in order to create the visual identity that they actually need to have on social media and on Facebook and everything. So I think there's going to be a lot of opportunities going forward into the end of 2020, um, all through 2021. This is probably just going to become what the market is now. And everyone realizes the importance of having good digital content. So by doing something and by having a discounted rate, essentially to have somebody sign up to a subscription to have you come into their business and, and do a half hour of photos with them every single month to generate maybe 15, 20 images. And then the idea is that they would probably also be contributing to their own social media feed, um, adding maybe 10 images. And then you can kind of cover out with most things. They would write the scripts and um, put everything together. And you could even bring this one step further and you could become a social media manager or you can hire somebody or partner with somebody to make this kind of the full package. I feel like a lot of companies are looking for that like, okay, I don't want to do social media. We're a small company here. What do we do? You can find one person that'll come in and just do it all and that's no longer something you have to deal with. I feel like it's a very attractive thing to sell to a lot of businesses. And um, you can kind of just figure out what works in your local area and then just keep advancing that and stepping it forward. But um, so yeah, there is a full course with, it's going to include all my pricing documents and everything that I do whenever I, I do these styles of shoots um, and this style of subscription model with companies. So that'll be coming to you and you're already in the group, so you're already founding members. So um, my question is, so this is the, the second part of it now that I've given you a little bit of background. Um, do you have any advice or know how to set it up as a solid business with the potential to hire other photographers in the future? Um, P.S. I was looking for this to be its own business and not add to my current business. So I think that's smart. I think that's very smart. Um, if you are a wedding photographer, your website's wedding photography based, I would not recommend trying to add kind of this commercial element to your wedding, to your wedding business website. Um, the other benefit is that as wedding photographers, I do feel like it's important to have our name on it. I feel like that that really helps you just sell more weddings. Um, if you are in fact the, the, the name on the door and they, they're emailing with you, I feel like that's a good thing. Um, when it comes to something like a commercial business, I feel like that becomes a little less important and the work is more important overall. Obviously they have to like you and they have to um, like kind of be on the same page and understand at least visually kind of like what you like. But if you're able to create something that you could potentially sell, that you could potentially hire other people under and that you could show that it's a profitable business and at some point you could potentially sell that entire business to somebody else, that's something that not a lot of wedding photography businesses, um, in fact, I'm not aware of any that have had a successful uh, sale like that. Um, please chime in in the comments if you know of any studios that have sold, but for the most part, it's a, a wedding business is really based around the photographer, the person that's going to be there on the day. For a commercial business, I think there's actually value in having a number of different shooters um, that all have a similar visual sense, but are different, I guess, artistically, um, simply because like maybe month number one, you go in, you do the shoot, you make some video clips for their Instagram. The next month, somebody else goes in and they create different images, especially if you're in like a shop or something like that's really has limited opportunities. You, you'll hit that wall pretty quick, but if you have additional people that can come in, they can see the space with their own eyes and they can create a lot of different stuff. So I think there's value in that, um, as well as value is actually potentially having an exit of some sort in that, um, that is just not possible with weddings. So um, yeah, full course on that to come, but I think that you're, you're onto something good there. And I think that this is kind of the time to hit that because I think that there's going to be a lot of opportunities. Andrew says, um, booking during COVID, what trends have you seen? How are you marketing in this time? Do you have backup plans if you fall sick? Um, so fortunately or unfortunately, I'm fairly certain, 99% certain that I've already had it. So I don't believe unless you can get reinfected that, um, that I'll be experiencing anything. I think just overall, um, 
I my contingency, my backup plan, and the thing that I tell couples if I ev am ever sick is that it is really a great photography community around here. And even in kind of the emergency situation, I've seen happen a lot of times that the night before a wedding or the morning of a wedding that somebody's on one of those Facebook groups and, and puts out kind of that 911 call, that there are always a lot of people willing to kind of help and, and immediately come to like, okay, where do you need me at 11 a.m.? No problem, like I'll be there. And the community really does come together whenever um, something bad happens to someone. So I would say if, if this, wedding photography group for local vendors doesn't exist yet in your area, I would say like be the person that creates that. And if it does, just like continue to cultivate that once it's safe to go out and have drinks or whatever on a patio with people, like start being in person a lot more with other photographers. And I feel like this becomes less of an issue and something that really does relax couples. Um, and now that everyone's gone through this collectively as an entire world, I feel like it's more important than ever to kind of explain that plan and explain like how, how well everybody works together when absolutely needed. So that would be my recommendation. For the first part of your question, what trends have you seen? I have personally seen a lot of people going to elopements, which is going to be the other course that's going to be going up um, on the new website, which you're obviously a part of. So you'll have access to that. Elopement course basically is everything that I personally do to, to book smaller weddings uh, and how things change a little bit. And then also there's gonna be an element on how to take this to a full destination level as well, that elopements are great at home and they're becoming, especially this year, increasingly more common, but for elopements, usually those are the options of you getting flown to somewhere like Iceland to do a small wedding or um, like just kind of all those major cities, the places that people want to go to have that amazing elopement style wedding. Um, I personally noticed, I guess to speak a little bit before I do the full course on this, is that most of the time people that are hiring me for elopements are usually based within, I would say, two hours of here or they've been at a wedding that I photographed or they've been following me on social media or something for a long time. But usually there is a local element that is based in that. So if you are interested in doing destination weddings once the world opens up again and life is safe, uh, I would say that the, the number one way is to market locally for people that wanna travel out there. So we'll get more into that. But um, I would say that's the biggest thing I've seen that a lot of people started with really big weddings. Um, I would say that most of my weddings maybe average 150 to 200 people, which I would maybe say is kind of middle of the road, depending on, on, on the culture that you usually photograph. Um, I would say that that's my normal size. And I would say this year and probably next year and probably the next year, guest counts are going to come back a little bit, which means potentially maybe they have more to invest in photography and that becomes more important to them. Um, or it means that they're just gonna have smaller weddings and they're gonna do cooler stuff, which I like both of those options. So um, yeah, that's kind of what I'm seeing, but I'll continue to report back with um, kind of any updates that I see. But as of right now, I think uh, 2021 is looking pretty incredibly crazy for all of us. Next question, I'm coming to Canada from sunny, sunny South Australia next July. 22nd July 2021, if the borders open to shoot a wedding, hopefully, I'm hoping that our borders, I feel like we can already go Canada to Australia, maybe. I'm fairly certain we can. Um, I think that there's a few countries that we can't. I feel like both of those countries are so far okay, um, but I'm not sure in the quarantine time, but it, it's, I'm assuming that's probably gonna end up being all right. Uh, this will be my first time in Canada, so hoping I can second shoot a wedding um, as a funny second shooter for someone for free. Um, so I guess if you're in the group here and, and you live in Victoria, Vancouver area, um, maybe send, uh, send them a message and if you're looking for a second shooter for your weddings. And that's awesome that it's because of, I guess, myself or the content that I put out that, um, that you managed to get this wedding. So that's really, really cool. All right, next question here, Kevin says, asks, uh, I just shot my first wedding last month and I'm building my portfolio for weddings. I'd like to book more, but now I need to advertise my first wedding shoot. How do you advertise a portfolio best with limited wedding experience in order to get more bookings? Um, so I would say that to make this a core part of your business and to be always looking for these opportunities, um, creating any sort of helpful content, becoming the guide to, to people getting married is always going to be the number one way to really get them connected to you as a brand while also injecting a little bit of your personality and, and your beliefs on what a wedding should be uh, throughout that content. Uh, and if they connect with that, they're going to connect very well with it. I would say with your first wedding, um, I, I would one be just kind of maximizing every single possible avenue from it, which means sending those images to the hairstylist, the makeup artist, the venue, the person did the cake, the like everyone involved with the wedding, that would be one of the first things that I would be doing. As well as if you're uploading, tagging all of them, you can do the vendor list tag on, on your Instagram. Um, so that's something that I would be doing for sure. And then beyond that, I would be creating, figuring out what the story is that I can tell 
from that wedding that will help future brides and grooms looking to get married. Um, you can take that from a venue standpoint, from a how to plan a wedding in this current weird time standpoint, to um, how to have a wedding if like you can't get together with all the friends and family that you wanted to get together with. Um, there's a lot of different options, so coming up with headlines for that that are going to be helpful for people, I think is kind of the key. And then beyond that, always my biggest, like my number one tip for all wedding photography business is to just get in control of creating your portfolio. So it's awesome that you've done one wedding, but now if you can set up three other shoots, um, styled shoots or shoots with friends and family, dressed in wedding clothes or dressed in almost wedding clothes, which is usually just like kind of a white longer dress that most um, most people kind of have. And if you, if you press at it and you're like, this is why I want that, they'll be like, uh, okay, can we do an outfit change halfway through? And that's totally fine with me. So I'd be doing that as much as I possibly could and creating as much wedding style content as I could over this year. And then also getting in touch with all the venues that I go to. Um, you can also do style shoots in local venues that maybe do smaller weddings. I feel like we're gonna see, as I kind of mentioned before, a huge upswing in these smaller weddings. So if you are, if there's a restaurant downtown that's maybe, that does some high-end weddings and maybe it's a 20, 30, 50 person capacity, maybe consider setting up a style shoot there in order to get in their good graces and create marketing material for them because I feel like that will that will come back to you and just do it in the easiest way possible for them. Like if they're a restaurant, they open at 11 a.m., say, hey, we'll shoot at nine and we'll be out of there by 11 when you open and we will be completely non-obtrusive to the staff setting up um, that you can live your daily life. We're here, we'll give you the images. And if you do something like that, people usually say yes. Sometimes they don't get back to you because they, they don't know you yet, but um, maybe the next time that you ask or the next time you show up there to shoot a wedding, that relationship uh, will be a little more solidified because they've already seen your name and you can create stuff together the future. Sydney asks, I'm considering making goodie bags to hand out at my longer engagement sessions. Any suggestions to add those bags to maximize marketing and leaving a good impression? That's awesome. Um, I have never done this and I think it's really cool. I would say the biggest thing, um, so I guess there's a few things that we've given out at, um, when, when I think back to the wedding shows, the things that really stood out. Uh, lip chap was like the thing that people just got really excited about to have. Um, so I would say maybe that would be one. And then we just simply bought a bunch of just kind of the generic kind of not no name, but like a nice smelling, nice actual product, no name ones. And then we just wrapped them with our own stickers. So we printed out a bunch of stickers and just did a little sticker wrap around the, the chapstick. So I would say something like that usually stays in somebody's purse or their car for a little while. Um, also thinking back to items, if they're coming to an engagement session, they're probably in their car. So whatever you can do, like little little koozies or something like that, if you can find a good price on branded koozies or um, maybe not koozies, but actual like tumbler glasses. Koozie I think is the thing you put your beer in. Um, if you can get a good deal on those tumblers, and um, they've already spent a lot of money to be there and maybe to spend $10 to give them something that they're actually going to keep for a significant period of time um, with your logo on it, they're going to bring to work, they're gonna to bring to the office, they're gonna to bring to everywhere, those are the same place. But uh, they're gonna carry it around a lot and they're gonna see your logo a lot and a lot of their friends are gonna see it. So I would say something like that. Um, and then actual just like the unbranded things or you can brand them if you want with little stickers. Um, Moo.com gives you like you can do these, I, I think it's 100 stickers and you can custom design each individual one if you want and they're little kind of small tiny guys or they'll do I think it's one and a half inch squares or one and a half inch rounds. So Moo.com to get those and just like sticker everything up and, and rebrand other people's products. I'm, I'm not sure on the legality of that, but I'm sure it's probably fine. All right, next question. Amy asks, uh, file sizing, I've had a graphic designer want to use an image and she's requesting that the file sizes are 75 megabytes, even if my RAWs aren't that large. What do you suggest shooting? Do you always shoot the largest possible? So this is a weird question. If somebody wants like a specific file size and not necessarily a DPI or I guess uh, a PPI, pixels per inch, not dots, because pixels. Um, 75 megabytes is super weird. I, if, if she's very adamant on having that 75 megabyte file, I would just send her a high res TIFF and it would be the exact same, like you'd be putting a JPEG into TIFF format and sending it to her. Um, but yeah, that's super weird and I'm very confused by that question, but I would just make it a TIFF and make it whatever she wants and here you go. Now you don't have to deal with it anymore. Next question, Christopher says, I started watching after your uh, Landscape Z6 YouTube video and ended up actually getting a Z6. My question is, how many batteries do you um, have? I mainly do portrait sessions, landscape, and a few events, considering getting a battery pack grip, um, if you think it's worth it. So I don't use a grip usually. Um, I find that it's just fine the way that the camera body is. I would say if you have 
even one backup battery in most situations. I'm, I've never used my Z6 as a main wedding day camera, but I've used it as my second body. And I don't think I got, I think I was at the bottom of the first battery. So it does have good battery life. I would obviously have a second backup. And then also because it does charge by USB-C, I would have one of those cell phone charger blocks, maybe an enhanced version that's really, that has a lot of charge in it. Um, so that you can just quickly do like a USB-C charge if you need to. Um, for something like if you're going in between locations or at a wedding, if you're sitting down for dinner um, or if you're out landscape shooting that you can like when you're sitting there having a beer, or having lunch or just sitting, enjoying enjoying the view as all the light comes together, um, that you're able to just charge up and get a little bit more juice into it that way. Um, I would say that, that would probably be what I would do. Uh, I think when I go to a wedding day, I usually have my main camera. They all use the same batteries now, fortunately. Um, so I'll have a Nikon D850 or a D780 with the newer style of batteries in it, the Z6 batteries, as well as my backup camera. And then I'll have an extra battery. So I guess I have two for each camera, but I would say maybe my main camera, I switch out the battery at one point during the day. And even if I'm doing photo video coverage, it's very rare for me to ever get through an entire second battery. So um, yeah, that'd be my, my suggestion. Kara says, best advice for someone's first wedding. What are your top tips walking into it? Um, kind of what I mentioned for the family sessions and getting over a little bit of the anxiety of that. I would have a bunch of photos up on your phone so that you're just able to quickly reference things or to show couples if you ever just get stumped for the words. Sometimes I'm like, oh, I want them to do this, but I have no idea how to how to communicate to that to, to them and a good way that actually going to make them do that. But if you need to show them a photo, usually it's like, oh, okay, we can just like, no problem, we, we get it. So I would say have that going on on your phone and just also for your own personal, I guess, stress removal. Um, as well as if like you're interested, my, uh, my photo checklist for wedding days is also up on the site so you can get that. And I wouldn't necessarily, if, if you know most of the photos and you, they're mostly kind of pretty obvious to you, I would just bold whatever ones you think that you might forget and then make a sub list from that. And maybe that fits on your phone or maybe that fits onto a tiny piece of paper um, that just to make sure that you're not kind of forgetting anything and to have a little bit of a guide over Overall. And then beyond that, I think it's just kind of the mindset of just do the best possible work you can for those people. It's their wedding day, like that they should be part of their wedding day. So work efficiently if you can and, and test things out on yourself. So if, say for instance, if I'm out in a park and I find a nice tree, I'm not going to bring the couple there and just like set them up and try to pivot them around until the lighting is the best. I'll just either, actually it's probably easiest to just load up your iPhone camera and just kind of pivot around until you find the direction with the light. And then you can just put them kind of right there. So um, I feel like that kind of speeds things up and, and makes me know that for sure everything that I'm actually doing has a purpose and will end up in the final gallery rather than just kind of play it around and be like, oh, that didn't really work out. Let's try this over here. Um, that if you can kind of shoot it on your phone with your, your own face first and make sure that everything's looking good, um, usually that kind of speeds up my process in that. And then beyond that, I think it just drink lots of water because it's a thing, that it's, it's silly, but we forget, especially if it's hot out, um, to keep your, your mental energy kind of going. And then I don't know if there's any official science to this, but I, I read an article that may or may not be false a long time ago, but basically that sugar and glucose kind of replace the, uh, the, the brain power that you expend whenever you are making lots of decisions and problem solving a lot. Um, so by eating sugar, you kind of re-stimulate that part of your brain. I don't know if the, that's science or not, but it seems to help me just having like a little tiny bag of candy, like sour kids or something um, to have kind of halfway through the day. I feel like that kind of brings me back up. I feel like coffee doesn't really do it. And especially if it's a hot day, like coffee is kind of a weird thing to do. Um, but I find that there are benefits to eating candy <laughs> during a wedding day, which is really funny. Um, Hunter says, how to manage expectations of second shooters. So for um, second shooters expectations wise, uh, I would say if it's somebody that you don't know, to create a contract so everything is just straight up in writing like here's what I expect of you here's what you can expect of me um, I feel like that just kind of puts you guys exactly on the same page going into the wedding day um, and then it also gives you a document like obviously you'll both sign this it also gives you a document in case they breach any of that for instance um, I am personally fine with my second shooters using images as long as um, basically as long as they're they're tagging me or saying that it is somehow involved with me um, and that's fine by me, but I know a lot of photographers that are like, if you're second shooting for me, those images belong to me. Like you can even go as far to give them a card at the beginning of the wedding day that you take on at the end of the wedding day. Um, there's really kind of no official rules to it. It's whatever you feel the most comfortable with. Um, but just to have everything outlined easily on paper um, to send to them is um, something that I feel like is kind of the, the best possible case that you both know exactly where you're at and there's nothing that could be misconstrued overall. Um, 
And then I think beyond that as well, um, I guess maybe these are all not necessarily expectations, but things that I would kind of expect. And the basics are like that you are working for me. You are not like whatever your name is, you're not giving your Instagram handle out to people. You are giving my name, my Instagram handle out that I am the photographer of this day. Um, there are obviously exceptions. If you're sitting there, you're at dinner with the wedding planner and the wedding planner is asking, hey, like what's your second shooter? What can I look you up? Um, that's, I would say, in most photographers' opinion, like that's fine to do. But to just like go out there and be like, hey, bridesmaids, like look me up, like check out this photo. Um, another thing that I usually ask is that like that my second shooter isn't trying to really kind of upstage me in any way, or there's like no fight for kind of power balance, which isn't really something you can put on a contract. But basically, that means like don't try to get people hyped up by showing the back of like your camera to people if you're the second photographer, that you are kind of there as an employee of me for the day. And I feel like that's kind of the, and like don't hand out your own business cards and that type of thing as well. Um, but yeah, that's kind of what I would do uh, and have everything in writing before the wedding day. And any rules that you come up with that you think are something that you, you think that they should know, feel free to put that on the document. It doesn't have to be like a lawyer style document. It can just be kind of bullet points like, hey, here's what we both agree on. You're shooting for me. I'm giving you this money. This is what you're gonna do. Um, I feel like that's, I don't know, good business practice. And the last question for today. When should I start offering video and what resources do you recommend? I would recommend my, <laughs> my course, um, Highlight Films for Wedding Photographers. That's not the name of it, but it's in the, the course's website right now. And you can, you're obviously a member, so you can just go to that and you can start ingesting that content. Um, I would say beyond that, so that'll teach you all the basics, all the things that at least I've learned as a photographer coming into video. The other things that I think video is important for and also the way that you get more into it is just by coming up with a project and doing it. Uh, that could mean that like if you're having a family barbecue that you create the best cinematic version of that family barbecue on camera that you possibly can or you start a new project. The project that we did was a full documentary that started out very small and spiraled to a much larger project very quickly that actually got funded. Um, that was my film school that I was like, I don't know how to make a proper good film, so I'm gonna figure this out. And it really kind of was just all the skills that I wanted to learn, that I wanted to learn how to do interview style coverage, I wanted to learn how to do this, how to mic it, how to like do that off-camera interview well. I wanted to learn how to do run and gun style uh, content with uh, for instance, startups stealing tables. They didn't steal them, but like taking, there's a bunch of different aspects that went into our film and it was all the elements that I wanted to kind of just learn. Um, so that's what I did and I felt that one, like you get to learn, two, we got funded, which I did not expect, and then three, you get to do something good for your community, which I think overall just positions you as a business owner and doing good local things. Uh, you're going to be a lot more visible, a lot more known, and at the end of the day, you're doing something with meaning and something that is actually valuable for your community. So I think that the attention that you'll get from that will far, um, it will surprise you, I think. And then also you'll probably end up on the media as well and you'll get on the TV and potentially the radio, the newspaper. Um, people like to feature good stories of happy things happening in the community. Um, there's far too much negative stuff going on. So if you can do something that's good, um, I feel like the media will pick it up and then you'll now have that brand that you are local, you're featured in your local like TV station and maybe that went national and maybe you were on the radio and maybe you were on the newspaper and here's a cutout and you can start pulling all of those as kind of your digital tear sheets to give you more credibility. And even though it's not specifically related to wedding photography, again, because our wedding photography businesses are all kind of our name, um, if, you, if you personally were featured really for anything, I feel like that all reflects back on you and like your character. So I would say do something like that and um, I would probably suggest like as soon as you have samples from a wedding uh, or you can do a styled shoot and you can, you can shoot the video that way, as soon as you have samples to start adding that as an additional um, element that people can get. I think mine started as kind of like a, just like a little one minute highlight film because I really wasn't convinced that I could make a three minute highlight film. Um, with Instagram, I could probably call it the Instagram cut uh, and be like, hey, it's a, it's a one minute video uh, essentially for Instagram. It's gonna be one minute long, set to some nice music. It's gonna essentially replace a blog post. So all the blog post elements would usually go on. That's now gonna be a moving video. Um, that would be kind of my sales pitch in the beginning. And then as I build out longer films, when I, when I go into one of those weddings to shoot that one minute highlight for them, I'm gonna do that one minute to deliver on the contract, but I'm also going to do something like a, a three minute film that maybe even includes audio so that I have that portfolio piece to show again to people in the future. So um, yeah, that's my advice. And thanks for being here. Thanks for everyone that submitted questions over on the Facebook group. If you are a member, a founding member, head over there and, and join the group and just gonna type in when you join and 
that you are in fact a member um, and I'll approve you and then you can ask questions for next week if you want. Other than that, founding member rate ends tonight, so hopefully you get over on that if you are interested and you get instant access to everything that really I've ever created as well as all my presets and all the things that I mentioned at the beginning. So um, head over there and I'm excited to, to have you as part of the new community and I will uh, see you again another time from our studio here. It's a nice day. Sorry that the variable clouds, a bit of a wild, wild and interesting uh, video experience today, I'm sure. But the clouds are nice. Very cinematic Simpsons clouds, as I would say, like the beginning intro to The Simpsons. That's what their cumulus clouds are called in my mind now. <laughs>